It's time for another edition of Lewis at Large. 60 minutes of smart talk radio featuring guests from all walks of life in conversation with your host, Warner Lewis. So sit back and lend us your ears for the next hour. Now here with today's first guest is the host of Lewis at Large, Warner Lewis. Well, welcome everybody to another edition of Lewis at Large. Yours truly Warner Lewis from the Flight Deck. And as always, that means, of course, some very smart Talk radio is in your future in this segment. Go forward to this one. We're going to be talking to Caitlin Doty, a brand new work called From Here to Eternity, Traveling the World to Find the Good Death. Well, who is Caitlin Doty? Uh, interesting background indeed. She is a mortician. She's also the host and creator of Ask a Mortician and the New York Times bestselling author, of course, of Smoke Gets in Your Eyes. She's founded the Order of the Good Death. She lives in L.A. where she runs her nonprofit funeral home, Undertaking L.A. So an interesting conversation is ahead indeed. Uh, Caitlin, how are you, my friend? I am. I'm great. Glad to be here. Well, we're pleased to have you here. We have talked about death before, not in lots of whimsical ways. But give our Lewis at Large listeners, if you would, a little bit about your background and why were you attracted to being a mortician in the first place? And then we'll get a little bit deeper into the content of the book. I grew up in Hawaii, which you don't really consider a morbid place. It's a pretty sunny, beautiful, tropical place. But I was still pretty obsessed with death. I had a negative experience when I was younger. I was at a local mall and I saw a child fall from a second story balcony to what I presumed was the child's death. And it was a very traumatic experience for me at about eight years old. And I became really obsessed with my parents dying and my friends dying and my dog dying. And I lived in a culture, as most people do in the U.S., where you don't really get to have these open conversations about death and why it may not be as scary as you think it will be. And I didn't get to have that conversation. And as I grew up, I became, I was still interested in death. I majored in medieval history in college and I was 22 years old and I decided that I wanted to see what was actually going on behind the scenes in the funeral industry. So I got my first job, which was as a crematory operator, the person cremating the bodies. And almost immediately it was like, well, This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life, probably, my life and death. And I've been doing it ever since, about 10 years now. So to make the decision to be a mortician, is that title reserved to those that are somehow certified and been through specific training and schooling? It is. I don't know that it should be. My personal opinion is that our industry in America needs to be a little more deregulated because it's wildly overregulated. But... Traditionally, yes, if you use the title funeral director, mortician, or undertaker, it means because you're licensed in your particular state to accept money for care and transportation, et cetera, of a dead body. What, uh, and I'm, I'm asking this because it has been a, a while, quite frankly, where I have been to a funeral where there was a casket. And my sense is, I don't know, I have not looked up statistics, you know them probably, the percentage of those that choose a casket versus cremation or some alternative form of burial, so to speak, or the foreverness of their remains, is that true? It is, and and the funeral industry is in trouble because of it. We just went over 50% cremation rate for the first time ever this year, so more people are cremated than buried, and less and less people want the whole rigmarole of the embalming and the wake and the suit and the makeup and the casket and the flowers and the whole deal. But the problem is the regulations of the funeral industry make it so it's really hard to run a funeral home unless you offer all of those things and you make money from all of those things. So there's going to be a lot of reckoning and soul searching that has to be done in the next 10 years or so in the funeral industry if it's going to stay an industry at all. Well, so I don't don't want to make too much light of this, but I, I could see the same way Holiday Inn now has Holiday Inn Express. Isn't the funeral home, so to speak, of the future more a crematorium? Could be very much centered that way and they wouldn't even offer caskets and those other sort of what are now considered probably profit centers? It is, yeah. And I would not like to see it go that way. I would like to see it go the direction because I think what's happening, I've worked in exactly what you're talking I've worked in the Holiday Inn Express part of the industry for many years, which is direct cremation, just do not pass go, body goes straight to the crematory, is cremated, family gets the ashes back. And that's often less expensive and that's a wonderful thing. But I really think that people are missing out on some kind of ritual around the death and around grieving and around the dead body. And that doesn't mean it has to cost more money. Some things I advocate for are 
having a home wake where, as we did for hundreds of years of American history, we keep the dead at home and just sit with the body and and have that kind of ceremony, or that we go be involved in the cremation. We push the button, we watch the body be loaded in, you can actually be there. There's lots of things that we can add. It's not, uh, the funeral industry often posits the only two options are full wake and funeral, or we take mom away and it's a cheap direct cremation. Is that what you really want? And those are shown as the only two options, but that's really far from the case. Uh, again, I want to dive into the book here. By the way, we're, this is uh, Lewis at large. You already know that. Yours truly, Warner Lewis, from the flight deck, as I am each and every week. We're talking to Caitlin Doty. Uh, she is a mortician. She's also an author. One, her first work called Smoke Gets in Your Eyes. The second one, From Here to Eternity, Traveling the World to Find the Good Death. Caitlin, uh, real quickly, what, what are the laws? If a loved one dies, family member dies, are you allowed to keep the body at home? or is You there- 100% are. You absolutely are. It is safe and legal to do that. And you have to check the laws in your state. Some states are say, you know what, just keep them for seven days. It doesn't even matter. Some states have slightly stricter laws. They'll say they have to be refrigerated after 24 hours. But all that means is that you put some ice packs underneath them, and that counts. Um, so it's good to check your laws. Sometimes you need a funeral director to sign off on it. But in every state, there is a way to keep the body at home. What about, let's also, let's discuss briefly before we dive into the book here, a little bit about Undertaking LA, nonprofit funeral home. Tell us about that. We wanted to make it a nonprofit because we wanted to let people know that we can help them even if they don't end up using us. And we also want to eventually create a system where maybe some people pay a little bit more to help other people who aren't able to afford funerals and and set up that kind of system. And right now, what we offer is very, very simple, inexpensive death care options. So we have cremations. We also offer natural burial, which is just a hole in the ground and a shrouded body straight in the ground. And most of all, what we encourage is involvement. We want people to keep the body at home. We want them to come in and dress the body. We want them to be there for the cremation or burial. We want to the extent that the family is comfortable and wants this, we want them to know that they're empowered to have it. What about uh, the the relationship, and I'll just we'll just use you directly as an example as a mortician between the death process, the burial process, and the various aspects and influences that religion, organized, and others uh, or faith based kinds of ceremonies have. Does that make it more complicated, or do you you encouraging that, or what do you see more of that or less of that? We de- we definitely encourage that, and I think something that happens a lot that can be really devastating is there is a Either if it's an immigrant family that comes in and moves to America or a strongly religious family that's in America. And the American funeral industry is not really set up to support them. So you're not, you know, there's all these things that they might want to do, whether it's an open pyre cremation or keeping the body at home or, um, you know, burying the body very quickly. That is really important to them. But the American funeral industry says, no, wouldn't you want an embalmed wake in a casket? And they're going, wait, no. So I think it's important to have funeral homes that say, yeah, you can, let's, let's do our best we can to create the religious practice that's really meaningful to you and your family. Well, in the work from here to eternity, you literally traveled the globe exploring, finding out, researching, attending, studying it, all different kinds of ways that people deal with death and deal with dispositions of bodies. It starts in Colorado. Why there? And uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, Colorado isn't exactly an exotic locale around the world, but uh, a friend of mine actually suggested that I move that chapter to the beginning, and I'm glad that they did because it centers us in this idea that not only is that other fascinating death traditions all around the world, but there is work being done in the U.S. as well. It's not this pie-in-the-sky idea, but it's happening at home as well. And I went to this this small town in Colorado that I've been working with for years called Crestone, that they've basically taken over the death care for their own town. When somebody dies, they come into the home and help them take care of the body. They're a small nonprofit. They only charge $500 for this and for an open-air pyre cremation, which is the only public community pyre like this in the Western world. 
And you go at dawn and you cremate the body on this open air pyre. And it's just the most inspiring thing that you've ever seen. Inspiring and healing for many people uh, ritual that you've ever seen. So when you set out to do this, as you set out on your journey, did was there a particular goal in mind? Or did you said, I'm going to visit X number of places or I know exactly where I'm going? Or was it kind of a work that evolved? And as you would go to one location and see something, it might spur an idea to go someplace different. It was absolutely a work that evolved. I, I had this idea. Originally, I think the book was going to be more of a transitional book, a more fun, you know, around the world in 80 corpses type book. But as I actually went to these places and started to travel to these places, I couldn't write blurbs about them. I wanted to write whole long chapters about what I saw and the rituals and the people and their stories. And it became a much more serious book over time. And really the places that I ended up going were places that I knew that I could get some sort of special access that a tourist or a a journalist even wouldn't be able to get because I know so many people in the death world. It's a very small community, the death world, a niche community. (laughs) Um, And I knew that I would be able to go to these places that that really haven't been seen before and and have a unique take on them. Where else in uh, North America did you go? I also went to North Carolina, where a colleague of mine is working on the process of composting dead bodies. She calls the process recomposition. And the idea is that you would put bodies, instead of cremation, you would put them in this nutrient-rich wood chip pile, and at the other end would be soil instead of ashes. And they do this in, or they're trying to do this in North Carolina at what we know as a body farm, technically called a human decomposition facility, where the bodies donated to science are tested on. And there were several bodies donated to science that were being composted to test this new method. And I was lucky enough to be there and see this take shape. And, and if this really become something that Americans choose, I feel like I was there at the beginning of something really, really special. What about, uh, let's take you over to, to Europe. Let's start there. Anywhere in Europe you visited? I visited Europe. Didn't make it in the book as much. I was in Berlin and uh, the UK and Australia and New Zealand. I was in more Western countries, but most of them didn't make it in the book except Spain. And the reason that I was so fascinated by Spain is because they actually have an incredibly active community in the way that I that I really appreciate an active death community. They show up for long wakes, they show up for the cremation, but everything in these beautiful Barcelona facilities was behind glass. So you would show up for the wake, but the body would be in a glass coffin. And then you would show up for the cremation, but the cremation would take place behind these long panes of glass. And so I, my question here was, I wonder if more people are showing up because there is that little barrier that they have that, that makes it somehow less threatening. And on balance, you know, for me, I'm like, oh, take the glass away. Let's just interact with the body. But is that glass what's really making it safe for so many people to come. And so that was kind of a a more existential question for me. And also, I'd like to know, how did you choose the particular ceremonies or the services that, that you went to? Did you just literally like look, go online and find out when various funerals were going to be? Or how, tell us about that. <laughs> I wish you could just go online and, and find that out. Um, no, again, it was it was knowing people. So, for example, I visited this very, um, very, very rural area of Indonesia. And they have this particular custom called the manene, where every three years they bring the dead out of their grave, their mummified dead out of the graves, and clean and redress the bodies. And I had heard about this. I, I've, I've long studied death cultures and traditions all around the world. So I knew about this, but it seemed like the kind of thing that I was never going to see. I'm never going to make it to the rural mountainous regions of this Indonesian island to see this. And then I'm with, sitting with my friend Paul Kudinaras in his house, and he's photographed death around the world for years. And he just casually says, oh, yeah, I'm going to Indonesia in August for the Manene. It's going to be, oh, it's going to be hard to get there. It's going to be a bitch to get there. You can come if you want. And I was just like, wait, what? I can come if I want? And not only that, he had been developing a relationship with someone who was um, 
local to the village or had lived in the village. And so they could you know, explain exactly why we were there and what we were trying to accomplish. And so it really, you know, it was very, still very difficult to get there and do all of that. But it, it was a way in that I never, I don't believe I could have done on my own. So anytime I, I saw an opportunity like that, I was very grateful for it. And that, and that also helped shape where I chose to go. Again, we're, we're talking to Caitlin Doty. She is a mortician, uh, has Undertaking LA, a nonprofit funeral home in uh, Los Angeles, and is also the uh, author of a previous work called Smoke Gets In Your Eyes. We're talking now about From Here to Eternity, about her journeys around the world, checking out various ways people celebrate and execute various funerals and, and services about that. Caitlin, the book is also illustrated. Interestingly, tell us a little bit about the illustrations and the illustrator. Yeah, the the illustrator is actually my ex boyfriend <laughs> named Landis Blair, and we were together for about two years, but we broke up very amicably, and we still work together on all sorts of projects. And we had started this project when we were together, and it was happy to keep doing it after we broke up. But the reason that I chose to have it illustrated. I've had a couple people ask, most people get it. I've had a couple people ask, why don't you just have pictures? Why don't you just have pictures of the things you saw? I know you were there and you must have taken pictures. And I did, but I think that I didn't want it to be too in your face. Like, look, here's a mummy. Here's a mummified skull. Here's this. Um, I think that the illustrations add a realness and a visual to it, but aren't overwhelmingly in your face because I think that would turn off some people. So I'm really happy with how the book looks all together. Well, let's uh, let's do this. And, and it's going to put you into the position of making some value judgments here for us. But share with mm-hmm. us a little bit. You saw lots of cultures. You saw lots of different ways to look at, at something that we all experience and that everyone is touched by in one way or another. If you could draw from all of these various experiences that you have, what would an ideal death, so to speak, and a celebration of life, so to speak, what would it look like? Mm, that's a good question. If you could morph uh, again, them Again, this is, yeah, this, again, this is my value judgment, as we said, just from my personal desire for how I'd like to see our own funeral industry in America, the one that I'm a part of, go in this direction. I think maybe Japan is a really good good place to draw from because not only do they spend the time with the dead body, so they're not they're not afraid of the dead body, they they spend time with the body, they have a wake, they often wash the body in a traditional ceremony, and they spend time with the body, but at the same time, they're not afraid of innovation at all. They have these amazing columbaria where, where ashes are stored with glowing LED Buddhas and robots that shoot your ashes down to the gravestone and, and all of this really interesting high-tech stuff. And I would like to see the American funeral industry adopt both of those things, not only a respect for the dead body and just being present with the dead body, but also not being terrified of innovation, because innovation is also something that gets butts in the seats. People don't want the traditional flat headstone 20th century American death look anymore. And they don't want the embalmed body and they don't want all of those things. So what else can we give them that's innovative and meaningful and still brings ritual to the death? So those are the things that that I'm exploring in my own work. And I hope other people will continue to do so as well. What about uh, the fundamental way we can confine this just to, to Americans? Death in the United States. There are people that do it in a very, very traditional way. There are those who are doing new age things all the time. Are you seeing from the vantage point that you see, is there any reason to think that we would turn back towards the more traditional, the true casket? And, the, and again, that the funeral becomes something where people are spending a fair amount of money in sort of this encasing bodies in boxes. Yeah. Well, the thing to to understand about that is that that's a 20th century invention. We call it traditional death or a traditional funeral, but that didn't start until the early 20th century. Prior to that, the families were taking care of the dead and carrying the body in a simple wooden casket on their shoulders to the grave. And it was only when this funeral industry developed that that perception changed. So I don't think that we're going to go back in that direction because from what I hear, people who want just 
simple, natural burials without all that. You know, you have baby boomers who are hippies and super liberal. You have libertarians who say, I don't want the government to tell me I have to do this with my body. I just want to keep it simple. You know, you have these strange bedfellows, but they still feel the same way about the dead body and about wanting to have more autonomy and not spend so much money on something that doesn't mean a lot to them. So as you look back, the book obviously is a summation and a reflection, but as you look back personally on all of the things that you saw, and I know you continue to see new things all the time, but on all the things mm-hmm. you saw, what what sort of, as we say, is, is sort of the headline from all of that, or what what's the one main maybe theme or feeling you came away from all of it? I think the main thing that I that I came away from it was the idea that that we're just not taking care of our grieving people very well in America. All these places I saw had such a safe place, whether it was a literal place, a physical space that was beautiful and intimate and, and beautifully decorated, or it was just the conceptual space that people put around grieving people to, to hold them in and make sure they feel safe. They do that in other places, and people are allowed to mourn, they're allowed to cry, they're allowed to laugh, they're allowed to openly have these feelings about death and the death of the people they loved. And that's not really happening in an American funeral home right now. And how do we how do we redesign the system so we're taking care of people in the most vulnerable time in their lives? Well, it is a fascinating work. It's called From Here to Eternity, Traveling the World to Find the Good Death by Caitlin Doty. Uh, Caitlin, before we get out of here, let's tell people how they can find out a little bit more information about you, pick up a copy of the book, and just kind of follow what you're up to. Sure. From Here to Eternity is wherever books are sold, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, your local bookstore. My website is theorderofthegooddeath.com and uh, Twitter at The Good Death. So if you just type in The Good Death, you'll find me. My goodness, what a way to be found. Hey, listen, thank you (laughs) uh, so much for your time. Interesting work indeed, and would love to have you back on again. What's your next project? Ooh, um, (laughs) we're actually, uh, just as I was talking about, we're actually redesigning our funeral home to be more user-friendly and more safe for the families. So that's the next big physical project. Sounds good. Listen, thank you again so much. Yeah, such a pleasure. You bet. We'll be back with more right after this on Lewis at Large.